Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. Today our topic matter that we're going to discuss are cancer treatments. And I want to point out, I've made a statement uh, at the very front of this, that the cancer treatments that I'm going to be reviewing today are going to be those that have been researched in conjunction with or by themselves, but can safely be taken with chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. So if you do have an oncologist that questions any of the supplements or dietary recommendations, these are all backed by research, university research, uh, that supports their year usage during cancer uh, therapy. Um, I'd first like to review the diet um, when you have cancer or you're fighting cancer or you have pre-cancer or even actually a preventative diet for as much as that goes. Sugar feeds cancer. It robs the body of oxygen. So when you eat foods that are highly processed, that raise your glucose or your blood sugars, it feeds or robs the body of oxygen, which in turn feeds cancer. So if you have at any type of cancer or pre-cancer, you need to avoid sugar, alcohol, and all starchy carbohydrates. I'm not saying all carbohydrates, but particularly those ones that really, really uh, increase and convert readily into sugar. Um, recommendation is to eat clean live food that is organically grown pesticide, herbicide, and growth hormone free. We know that growth hormone given to people causes cancer tumors to grow crazy. So here we got growth hormone in our chickens and our beef milk, name it. Um, Uh-oh, it's going to obviously contribute or to the growth of cancer tumors as well. So get organically grown fruits and vegetables, organic meats that aren't full of growth hormones. Also, too, especially with estrogen-driven cancers, uh, pesticides are estrogen mimickers that feed cancer. So eating clean, live foods that are pesticide, chemical-free, best way to go if you've got cancer, actually best way to go no matter what you have or don't have. Um, eating foods that are high in glutathione. Glutathione is the strongest antioxidant known to man produced in the liver in combination with vitamin C. Vitamin C helps induce that uh, glutathione output. But there are certain foods that we can eat, and there are supplements that you can take as well. We'll discuss further on to increase glutathione. But the foods that increase glutathione, this strong liver antioxidant, that will help you detox during your chemo or during your radiation and help you fight off the cancer are going to be such things as asparagus, avocados, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, Ugh, gag, I'm not a Brussels sprouts fan. Cabbage and walnuts. Those are all things that tend to increase glutathione uh, in the liver. Eat as many raw fruits and vegetables. I do know how to spell fruits. Sorry about that. Uh, as possible, especially those that have a deep, rich, lots of color. So lots of greens, purples, oranges, um, uh, yellows, all of those types of, of rich colors have a very strong antioxidant ability naturally to help you fight off the cancer and survive the chemo and radiation. Um, part of the reason why I'm doing the show on this subject today is I've had two female friends, uh, actually two, they were my friends, but they were also my relatives, die not of the cancer they were being treated for, but of the chemotherapy. And so anything that we can do to help people survive chemotherapy if they choose that option, I'm all for it. So that's why I, I find this subject really, really particularly personal and important to discuss. Um, so when you eat raw vegetables and fruits and vegetable juicing, they have, they're very rich in enzymes, rich in antioxidants. They also alkali the blood. And when you alkali the blood, your body's, remember how I told you how cancer loves an oxygen-deprived acid environment? Well, cancer doesn't like an oxygen-rich alkali environment. So we're going to make it an unfriendly place for the cancer to spread or even develop. So eating those raw fruits and vegetables, once again organic, or juicing, if you've got a good juicer, is very beneficial to help also, too, the liver detox from chemotherapy and radiation. Eating lean protein, particularly plant protein or egg protein or whey protein, 
uh, eggs, tofu, poultry, fish. We're going to avoid beef and pork. They're very, very acidic um, for the body. And so these are leaner pieces or types of meat, particularly a chicken breast uh, when you're talking about chicken. You don't want a lot of saturated or um, uh, a lot of fats. You don't want the bad, what we call bad fats, the saturated fats or the polyunsaturated. Those are just going to contribute to the growth of cancer because they oxidize in the body. So plant sources of fats like walnuts and almonds and pecans and things like that don't oxidize as readily like meat fats do. So sticking with the lean uh, cuts of meat or go, uh, lean cuts of meat or the plant sources of protein is the best way. Remember, protein also helps you keep your energy levels up. If you're undergoing chemo and you're just not able to digest a lot of this or you just don't have an appetite, there are whey protein and egg protein shakes that you can do that will help keep your energy levels up and help you to be able to survive the chemo. Eating garlic, onions, and legumes to keep your liver functioning at optimum levels. I know you're thinking, garlic and onions? Well, they're very rich in certain antioxidants, particularly quercetin, which we'll talk about supplement-wise, which is a very, very strong an um, antioxidant for prostate, uh, liver, and lung cancers. So these are all rich in that particular form, and they are also help prevent secondary infections as well. I want to review very specifically with you today the supplements that are backed by clinical research uh, that can be taken during the surgery, chemo, or radiation. Uh, they can also be taken if you choose not to do that as well as having anti-cancer effects. But like I said, most of the research that I dove into included uh, those people who chose, those, chose the options of doing the standard uh, allopathic medicine. This is, and I know you kind of look at this, this is a kind of mushroom uh, that has been very, very researched. Um, it's got kind of a weird kind of shape. If you, if you see the name, you can punch it online and see what it looks like. But a lot of studies, uh, the University of Shanghai did a 650 patient research, uh, and what they found was this particular type of mushroom reduced chemo side effects, primarily in esophageal, lung, stomach, and colon cancer. In addition, it also helps with cancer survivor, survival as well. But to reduce those side effects, once again, to help the ability to survive it, very well researched. Mataki. Most of the research that's been done on mataki has been out of Japan. It's a mushroom, and we hear a lot about mataki, shiitake, and all the different types of mushrooms. Well, mataki, and they have, uh, I have wrote, written the dosage down based upon the studies that they did. Um, what they found was most effective for breast, prostate, liver, and lung cancers. It showed cancer regression. Now, these are very good percentages. Significant symptom improvement and a 66% in 66% of the people with breast cancer, 58% of people with liver cancer, and 62% of people with lung cancer for both ability to not have so many side effects with the chemo as well as being able to live and survive the cancer. So, and there's a lot more research than what I've written down here on Mataki. Uh, prolytic en enzymes, very anti-cancer, they help Mm. All, of, all of the bodily functions that we, cellular functions that we have go on, require enzymes, okay? And in order to be able to repair the body and recover from chemo, radiation, and surgery, these enzymes aid digestion, especially they'll break down food when you're undergoing chemo, um, chemo which can be like battery acid to the digestive tract. The digestive enzymes can help break down that food to increase absorbability and then give you enzyme activity so your body can repair. Uh, L-glutamine. This is an absolute must if you're going to do chemotherapy. I can't tell you the countless number of people that have used the dosage that's recommended, and there are a few oncologists in the area and around that recommend L-glutamine. But what it does is it protects the intestinal mucosa lining from the damaging effects of the chemotherapy. Chemo, like I said, it can be battery acid on, on, on the digestive tract. This helps protect it. They estimate that close to 50% of people that die from chemo die because of malnutrition. It's so hard on their body, they can't eat, they won't eat, and their body can no longer absorb the nutrients. So anything we can help or use to help the digestion process work better and absorb nutrients, go for it. Um, uh, astragalus. 
very interesting herb. Dr. Andrew Wild tends to promote this one a lot for cancer, uh, but there's research to back that up. What it does is it enhances the killer T cells and the immune system. University of Texas research found that it restored or enhanced the function of white cells, and it also supported bone marrow production. A lot of chemos and radiation affect the body's ability to properly manufacture bone marrow, which is responsible for B12 and other things as well. And so therefore, potentially looking down the road may be a helpful thing for prevention of bone cancer if your bone marrow can work properly. Um, curcumin, also known as turmeric extract. It's a very anti-cancer thing, both in preventative and treatment. It can be taken at the same time as chemo and, and radiation as well. Essiac, kind of controversial. Uh, it is also known as a cancer tea. Under John Kennedy's era, back in the 1960s, his surgeon generals, I believe it was mother, was cured by using this blend of seven different herbs that were from Canadian Indians, and Renee Case had bottled it and distributed it. They're estimating that tens of thousands of people have been cured just by solely using this uh, as their cancer treatment. So you can take that in conjunction as well with your chemotherapy or your radiation too. You can research more online about it. I've, I've spelled it out. And so if you want more information, that would be the best source to look it up. We've got a second page. There's a lot more supplements than what I've just written down on here. And some of them are kind of controversial that maybe I might believe in them, but a lot of oncologists uh, kind of put their hands off. So I'm putting things on here that are not controversial. These are ones that we know will help. IP6, um, it boasts the immune system. Modified citrus pectin, and you're like, citrus pectin, modified, what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of good research on modified citrus pectin. It comes in bottle, a capsule form, and the study suggests that it reduces the risk of prostate cancer metastasizing. So what that means is it prevents it from spreading. But there's also research on it having to do with certain types of brain cancers and other cancers for prevention of metastasizing. Getting, keeping the cancer from spreading once it's gone or once it's there and keeping it from spreading, that's the purpose in order to allow, if you choose chemotherapy and radiation, to be able to work. Quercetin. We mentioned, you know, the onions and garlic have quercetin. Well, in a supplement form, it's much higher in its potency and it inhibits tumor formation and also has been very well researched for prevention of prostate cancer cell replication. That means if this, the cancer cells, it will reduce the, how fast they, they replicate uh, in the, in the um, man's body. Fish oil. When you undergo chemo, oftentimes you have a lot of tissue wasting. The body just kind of wastes away. That's why you'll see chemo patients just drop weight so fast. There's been a lot of research on maintaining protein levels, meaning whey pro easily digestible proteins that we discussed earlier. But for some reason, fish oil also really helped prevent muscle wasting. There are other, other things that are not well researched in conjunction with chemo that we know protect against muscle wasting, but fish oil has been researched in conjunction with those other treatments. 4,000 milligrams, that's like four of those good size little caps a day, prevents that, t uh, that uh, tissue wasting that we see in chemo patients. Greens, 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 we should say the magical everything. They oxygenate the blood. There are some greens that are just so much richer, spirulina, coriola, um, I've got them on wheatgrass. Um, all of these help support the oxygenation of the blood, the alkalinity of the blood, and enable the body to better detox on a cellular level in response to chemo uh, treatments. They'll increase your energy a little bit too, because uh, they oxygenate. And anytime you oxygen alkali, you feel better. Probiotics, these are the good little critters that um, exist mostly in the bowel that help you break down your food. Remember how I mentioned how chemo kind of shreds up the gut? Certain kinds of chemo, not all, but the majority I've seen do. Um, what the probiotics do, these, these um, little critters, they line the digestive tract and they help you break down your food. They produce uh, things like serotonin, which are real important for mood and being antidepressant. Well, when you're undergoing, uh, particularly chemo, these probiotics are a must in combination with L-glutamine to help you be able to break down your foods. 
Melatonin, there's several studies on melatonin levels, both in a preventative, but we're, today we're discussing uh, what you can take in conjunction with your treatment. Several studies show that it activates immune cells and improves the action of chemotherapy drugs and radiation. It improves the action of allopathic medication drugs, radiation. Think about that. So definitely something that you might want to consider if you're undergoing those treatments right now because it'll make it work better. Milk thistle. Oftentimes when we're undergoing chemo, well, not often, every time, remember there are poisons that go into the body. You're trying to poison the cancer. The only problem is, is it also poisons the healthy cells. So milk thistle helps protect the liver and restore liver enzymes. Your liver is your key de to detoxifying agent. De well, detoxifying organ is better. And so if you can keep the liver functioning better, you can detoxify all these toxic chemicals that you're taking in chemotherapy. I've written a dosage uh, down on here that's necessary based upon research that was conducted. A food-based multivitamin and mineral. I've had more oncologists say, oh, stop doing your multivitamin. Now the people aren't eating, they don't feel very good, and they tell them, you can't take any of your vitamins anymore, your basic nutrition, nutrients for survival. This is absolutely hogwash because you require certain nutrients in order to be able to stain certain bodily, temp, body, uh, bodily functions. So where I've um, kind of compromised in this issue and most of the research is backing is if we go with whole food based vitamins and minerals that are all 100% from whole foods, we can get the nutrients in the body without sending your oncologist in a tizzy trying to debate with you. So. Don't forget, do the multi, just do a food-based one. Green tea, lots and lots of research on green tea, particularly once again by the Japanese. Japanese study of 472 stage one, stage two, and three breast cancers patients decreased the numbers of auxiliary lymph node metastasizing of the cancer among premenopausal women in a significant amount. So you know how oftentimes when they remove the breast, they have to remove all the lymph nodes, and then, or if they remove the breast, they're concerned. If they don't take the lymph nodes out, it'll spread. Green tea in higher dosages helps prevent those breast cancer cells from metastasizing into the lymph nodes. There are uh, a few things that you can take for nausea and vomiting as well. I wanted to mention they're homeopathic. All homeopathics are safe to take with any drugs or medications, and I've listed them down on here. Uh, cadmium sulf uh, helps with um, fatigue, vomiting, and hair loss. There are other controversial things such as vitamin E that I'm not going to discuss today because it's controversial that also can prevent that. Um, these two right here can be very, very helpful uh, for that nausea and fatigue that accompany the chemotherapy. I also want to mention there's something called lymph massage. And what that does is lymph, the lymph is what carries all your, flows your immune. Um, oftentimes what happens, you'll see people when they do chemo, they, they swell, or you people see people swell, period, when they're under certain medications. And it's been found with certain types of cancers that a good lymphatic massage, and you can learn to do it yourself, or there are professional massage therapists who probably do a much better job, uh, that can do lymphatic massages to help the body eliminate the toxins a little bit better and help the immune, the body's own natural immune, deal with the cancer. This is just a very minor amount of all the things that have been researched, but the things that I found to probably be the most significant that I know you can do with chemo, surgery, and radiation. We're going to be moving on to the next segment of our show, which is the fitness portion. Welcome back. Um, we're going to be doing some fitness exercises and we're going to continue our facial fitness exercises here. So I have to set all ego aside and realize that I'm helping you try to firm things up in your face. So sorry about the scary close ups. Okay, first of all, I'd like to work on this area right here. Oftentimes, what happens with age is the eyebrows will sink down 
And so what this exercise does, and once again, this is an old Jack Elaine exercise. What this exercise does is it will help lift your eyebrows. And I saw some pictures literally where it helped people within a matter of weeks. So here we go. You put your hand right here just below your brow line and you resist. So you kind of scrunch down and make a little bit of a monster face. And what you're doing is you're trying to give resistance here. And you're going to do that about 15 or 20 times. Probably, um, I would say what's called two sets. And I would do it, try to do it every day for a while if you can, because that will help get it going. And then maintenance wise, maybe two, three times a week. The next one is for the sinking, saggy, double chin area. And so we're going to make all kinds of funny faces doing this. First of all, you ch tilt your head back, kind of put your jaw a little bit out, and you're going to go like this. Okay? And you do 15 reps straight forward. Turn off to the left as long as your neck's in an okay shape. 15 reps this way. Okay? And then turn off to this angle. 15 reps this way. And if you could do that a couple of times a day, thank God the close up is gone. If you could do that a couple of times, a couple of sets a day, Probably after a couple of weeks from the pictures I've seen, you're going to start to firm up these muscles so they're going to pull everything kind of up. Next, we're going to be uh, moving on to our research portion of the show. to the research portion of our show and with us today is Ralph Tertiano. Ralph. And thank you for the intro. Well, looks like vitamin E is back in the news again, but in ways you would not normally expect. A while ago they were really bad mouthing vitamin E, the major media, but why are they not talking about it positively now? Well, here's some interesting studies. Out of Oregon State University, published in Nutrition Review, remember I tend to do only deal with published news articles or published scientific articles. Women taking vitamin E had 24% fewer deaths from heart disease. Vitamin E's protective effect appeared even stronger in women over 65. It reduced their heart disease down by 26%, but even more astounding, it reduced cardiovascular deaths down by 49%. That should be national news. That's massive impact, and that's how you lower your health care expenditures. On top of that, the National Review Board set the upper limit, the safety limit of vitamin E at 1,500 IUs. Reason any higher because it begins to block a little bit of that vitamin K utilization in the body. Sounds like a little bit Coumadin, but maybe the medical establishment moved to vitamin E instead of Coumadin or, or Warfarin or Rat Poison, whatever you want to call it, would have a little bit better effect. Vitamin E again. This time in a way that you may not think of, rectally. Why? For moderate moderate ulceritis, ulcerative colitis. This is what happened. When administering vitamin E through the other end, what they discovered was basically, and this was published in the World Journal of Gastroenterology too, this came out on October 21st. They took 15 people after 12 weeks of administering vitamin E the other way. They found nine of the 15 went into total clinical remission. Everyone got benefit. It, benefits began to start showing for all 15 after 15 weeks. Or sorry, I apologize, 12 weeks. And the reason they believe is because vitamin E's antioxidant ability reduced the inflammation down in the intestinal tract very effectively enough to knock them into clinical remission. That's pretty incredible. And the Mayo Clinic is the one that ran the, the test itself. A pretty phenomenal for vitamin E. Something that has to be looked at again. And this is one for fibromyalgia. You know what doctors often tell you? It's maybe depression or social isolation that caused the fibromyalgia. That's all in your head. Well, the part right. But it's not depression, it's not social isolation, and it's not anxiety. It is in your head. They discovered that basically there's brain perfusion abnormalities. They could not find out why people with fibromyalgia complained of chronic pain like arthritis with inflammation and all these other symptoms and muscle pain and you name it without any inflammation. Well, it's not in the joints, it's not in the muscle. They do believe it's in the brain. They discovered the greater the brain perfusion, the greater the results of the fibromyalgia itself. Basically, they said too, fibromyalgia may be related to a global dysfunction 
of cerebral pain processing not found in healthy subjects or people without fibromyalgia. That's groundbreaking. A lot of people being treated the wrong way with anti-inflammatories and things like that. It's not that. It is in the head. They have to look at it a little more. Also now another one in regards to Alzheimer's. Another incredible what appears to be almost like a miracle cure. This is with a vitamin B3 derivative called nicotinamide. What the researchers at the University of Irvine discovered when given animals which had plaque or this tau, this protein buildup in the brain, they gave them the equivalent of about two to three grams of nicotinamide or vitamin B3 form. Basically, they said this. Cognitively, they were cured. Again, in the Journal of Neuroscience, they performed as if they never developed the disease. Two to three grams of nicotinamide, a B3 derivative. That was phenomenal. They said also this, quote, the vitamin appears to work by clearing tangles of a protein known as tau in the brain cells. In Alzheimer's disease, the protein becomes poisonous and contributes to dangerous clogging in the brain cells. And this said all this done for less than $30 a month. Pretty phenomenal. Not national news, but you'll hear it over here. Another thing in regards to allergies. This one will go a little bit backwards. Allergies are bad. Now remember, this is not asthma, this is allergies. In December issue of the Quarterly Review of Biology, they said at Cornell University that allergy symptoms may protect against cancer by expelling four particles, some of which may be carcinogenic or, or carry or carry absorbed carcinogens from the organs they like to come in contact with. Medical research have long to specify an association between allergies and cancer. So they said, so if allergies are part of the bias defense against foreign particle invaders, is it wise to use antihistamines and other suppressants? Really interesting consideration. They have to do more review. Next question is this. This has to do with preemption, and this goes before the Supreme Court. What would you do if you realize your drug manufacturer is not held liable for lying about the results of their medications? Well, it's ahead of the Supreme Court, and this is what happened. It's called this. The FDA's approval of drugs absolves companies of any responsibility if that drug later turns out to be dangerous, even if the information was concealed from the FDA during the approval process itself. Again, preemption. They use an example of Johnson & Johnson. 1996, they came out with a birth control patch. They sold it by selling it required less estrogen than basically birth control pills did. They found out that they ended up lying completely. Instead, what they used is a correction factor. Their correction factor on page 425 report of the scientific article from Johnson & Johnson basically just messed with the math. As a result, Johnson & Johnson was saying, well, the FDA approved it, therefore you have no lawsuit. And thank you very much. And that's the end of the segment. Thank you very much, Ralph. We appreciate your information. Once again, we hope that the various segments of our show will encourage you to further research all of these topic matters. Thanks again.